subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. I'm with Dr. C. Rajagohan, the director for the Institute of South Asian Studies in the National University of Singapore in Singapore. And today we are talking about Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the U.S., uh, the first in-person meeting since the pandemic, which is the last uh, 18 months or so, his first meeting with uh, the U.S. President Joe Biden, the first meeting of the Quad, which is significant. Dr. Raja Mohan, you're in Singapore. Welcome so much to the print. Thank you, Jyoti. Yeah. So your first comments um, on Prime Minister Modi's visit uh, to the U.S. meeting uh, Joe Biden. And what actually struck me in the Quad statement, and we can go back and forth on the bilateral as well as the quadrilateral is. And let's talk about the quadrilateral first. He's, the statement, the joint statement uh, um, issued says, we, the leaders of Australia, India, Japan, and the United States convened today in person as the Quad for the first time. It's quite eloquent, isn't it? It, rem it reminds you a bit of India's own constitution, we, the people. What do you make of it? No, I think uh, each uh, country has its own style. Probably the guys who are drafting it, I mean, must have put it. You know, you have to raise the language uh, and the rhetoric to a higher level when, when you have this kind of a forum. Certainly when a new one and that two meeting for the first time physically. So I think overall, uh, I would say it's uh, a pretty impressive uh, expanse uh, of the agenda covered. Uh, it is both, I mean, there is much overlap between the bilateral as well as the quadrilateral. Uh, because once I think uh, the Americans seems to have agreed with India that look, Quad should not be a security forum. Mm -hmm. uh, because India was the one which was resisting before. It's like, we don't want to make it a, a military forum. We don't want to make it a security forum. Uh, so therefore, what we're seeing now why is, is really... Why, uh, uh, but why is that? Why didn't India want to make it a military forum? That is how India is. I mean, it doesn't want to get into military coalition. So it is said, look, we don't want a military forum. So the American seems to have uh, made it easier for India by saying, okay, you don't want to be military. So we'll do this non-military stuff. And that's why you see an expansive set of things. Uh, we saw it initially uh, in the digital summit in March, and now uh, covering a whole range of areas. Some of it were identified in March, like the vaccine initiative on critical technologies. And they have significantly expanded uh, that, that agenda to cover a, a wider range of issues while consolidating some of the earlier moves. So I think for India now, it's a far more comfortable setting that we can do a lot more things because this is not Asian NATO as the Chinese were branding it, that this is actually, uh, as Prime Minister Modi said, this is a force for public uh, global good that is focused on public good, uh, public goods in the international arena rather than setting up a, a gang against the, against the Chinese. So I think for India, it's a very good setting, and I think it will also have greater credibility in the region where I live, much of the world. Uh, much of them were convinced by the Chinese propaganda, is this a ganging up against China? So, But this is by laying out a much wider agenda, uh, they increase the sustainability as well as the credibility of the Quad. So, so several questions from that, Dr. Arjun. The first is, did the Americans want it to be a military forum? And, that, and as you suggested, that the Indians pushed back and said, no, we would much rather not have have it like that and the second is why not considering the chinese are sitting on your territory in ladakh would it not be a good thing for india to ally with the americans still the most powerful country in the world uh, against china in a military forum look i think india is, you know does a lot bilaterally on the defense side uh, with the united states and in fact the the bilateral statement talks about uh, expanding defense cooperation what india does not want i mean uh, is that it doesn't want a, a coalition, a military coalition, or a NATO-like coalition. Uh, I would think the initial, in the, when the Quad idea started out, I'm sure the Americans were interested in making it a military organization. Uh, but I think Indians were quite clear from the beginning, the Quad is not a military organization. But why not? But why not? The fact yeah, that... You should, look, I think you know the uh, Indian mindset uh, so long. So this is uh, India's position, a historic position. They'll do a lot of bilateral cooperation. They've done it with Russia. They do with the Americans. They do with the French. But they don't want a, a coalition uh, or an alliance uh, of the kind that uh, it might be perceived as. Uh, so I think so. that is a, a historic tradition of India. So uh, there's no point saying, why not? But the fact is, it was quite clear they were not going to do it. And the Americans came around to the view. And I think that is the interesting thing. So this makes it India now can be more active participant 
in the non-military uh, range of uh, issues that uh, that the U.S. has, you know, that the Quad leaders have identified, and many of them also figure in the in the bilateral domain. Bilaterally, it's not as if India has not had military pre- a military presence or intervened uh, militarily abroad. For example, in Sri Lanka uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, the Indian peacekeeping force is, is, of course, the most recent event. 1971, you can go back to the Bangladesh war. So in 2021, this hesitation, do you think uh, it's... No, no, I think you're mixing up two things, Sajjati. One is what India does on its own in the neighborhood when its interests are at stake, that is military intervention. Here we're talking about political institutions designed as military coalitions to deal with a particular threat. Now, from independence, India has been opposed to that. Like India has had a security treaty with the Soviet Union that was bilateral. India does a lot of bilateral cooperation with a lot of countries. So that continues, including with the United States. In fact, last 20 years, and India's bilateral defense cooperation, the U.S. has significantly expanded. What India says is, look, don't make the Quad into a military coalition. So that is now settled and, and now they're going to focus on non-military aspects uh, from vaccines to uh, you know whole range of other technologies. So, so I think it's a, it's a different, okay. uh, fr- I think it's now comfortable framework for both. So does that mean that, or is that one of the reasons why the Americans looked for uh, AUKUS, which is the Australia, UK, US trilateral military uh, cooperation agreement? No, I, I think there was a different logic for that. I mean, that the as Chinese naval power is growing in the Western Pacific, the idea that, look, uh, having uh, nuclear submarines with France and probably the deployment of the British and the American nuclear submarines, we talk about nuclear-powered submarines uh, in uh, Australia, would significantly add to the deterrence uh, of uh, of, uh, of China on the, on the ground. So this is uh, clearly driven by a military logic. I don't think the Americans uh, would have come to us with that kind of proposal. They know India's position. So, so I don't think we should see them in lump together. That, that is a, a specific response to a specific security threat between friends, partners, and allies. It's not that they're new partners. US and UK no historical allies. Uh, Australia has had an alliance with the Americans called ANZUS that is 70 years old. So that is among allies. Uh, who willing to transfer a very sensitive technology to increase deterrence of the United States. And India was not going to be a part of that. Okay, so explain to me, the, uh, in the AUKUS alliance, will these submarines, if you know, they're likely to be built by the British and given to the Australians, will they also have nuclear weapons on board? Or how does it work? No, that's why I said these are nuclear powered. That is the propulsion, you know, instead of diesel-y, diesel-generated power, it will have nuclear reactor producing the power. Uh, so, so that is the difference. The, the, the difference between the in operational performance is that the nuclear-powered submarines can operate underwater for a longer time. They're harder to detect. They have longer range. They have more endurance. So they can reach out to much longer distances and are less discoverable. So they're far more effective. But I think, you know, AUKUS uh, was there, but, but I think uh, we should talk about the Quad. So let's go back to the Quad <laughs> since... Uh, now, if you know, if the Quad is primarily driven by non-military objectives, whether it's um, vaccines, climate change, do you think that this uh, that the that the meeting of minds between four countries, between four uh, democracies, who who sort of spread across the world, what's the significance of that? You know, for example, I think for, from a purely national point of view, I, mean, I think uh, this partnership with the uh, world's number one economy and the number three economy, both of uh, US and Japan are large, you know, uh, not only large economies, but they're also leading techno- you know, technological uh, uh, power centers. So by working with them, I think one, India can strengthen uh, its own national capabilities on a range of areas. And for US and Japan, and to draw India and Australia into this coalition, gives, put them together, they bring in a mass and a heft uh, that is uh, almost equivalent to what China can bring to bear. So, uh, for example, on vaccines today, China has a dominance in terms of the uh, the, the the supply chain. Uh, today, what the U.S. has done under the vaccine initiative, for example, both the bilateral statement as well as the quadrilateral statement talk about it. Uh, they're funding more vaccine production in India. The e- biological E in India uh, with the U.S. support is going to produce uh, more vaccines. 
right. uh, and then the japanese are uh, funding you know the the production and then you have the uh, australians are going to deliver it to indo pacific so i think when we pool our resources uh, we can do a lot more good in the region and and offer an alternative this is not about containing china this is not about balancing china that you offer alternatives uh, which then make it easier for the much of the region uh, to to uh, to to choose between these alternatives so you know when prime minister modi meets uh, when he met the us president he said trade is an important factor in the india us relationship but the fact remains that over the last 2 or 3 years before the pandemic as well india and the us have failed to come together to sign even a small like uh, a free trade agreement you know leave alone one that is overarching so while we can talk about trade being an integral part of it and perhaps a fundamental part of it but it doesn't seem to happen look i think the politics of trade have, you know have changed uh, in the united states so it is not like well trump was kept pushing india on trade 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 uh, the uh, it is biden who didn't raise the trade issue it was modi who raised the trade issue mm-hmm. because i think there is a recognition from india that we need to have an expanding trade relationship and uh, trade is actually growing despite the fact that uh, we dis- disagree on it trade between india and the us has dramatically grown in the last 10 years so the question is uh, uh, in under the new conditions where within india there is a lot of resistance to free trade agreements so there is resistance to free trade within the us in the current situation so what can we do to promote trade i mean i think um, they have agreed to start a uh, dialogue under the trade policy forum so i think uh, you know as more opportunities open up for the american investment in india uh, my sense is there will be new possibilities but they both sides are now uh, agreed in this uh, forum to to start talking about trade but you know i think it's the other way around isn't it that biden administration is is much more on multi, is is much stronger on multilateral trade than the uh, trump guys were in fact the trans pacific partnership is something no, no there are two things i mean one is the multilateralism which means uh, looking for collective solutions to the towards problems but on trade the domestic politics in the us has changed I and mean, i think both within the democrats as well as in the in the republicans today there is no support for free trade agreements Not thanks to their experience with china yeah. there is very little support so i don't think biden is pushing for any free trade agreements in fact he said it very clearly they're not going to sign any free trade agreements because there's not a ghost of a chance for the us congress to approve any new trade pacts but there are within that constraint there is a lot more trade we can do with each other so in the end what matters is are we trading more with each other and not question whether we have a trade agreement uh, so if they can facilitate more trade between the two countries uh, that will be welcome so are you saying that the biden administration's uh, trans interest in the trans pacific partnership is dead in the water no they are not going to go back to it i mean trump walked out uh, the uh, we are not part of the dpp debate but um, no, uh, biden is showing no enthusiasm at this point to, to join the treaty so so they are very clear they look finally it's about politics right there's domestic politics there's no room for a free trade agreement so maybe after the midterm elections but at this point Uh, Biden administration is not looking for trade agreements. So the fact that the uh, Biden administration has done these two partnerships, uh, whether it's the Quad or the AUKUS, and it's getting like-minded countries together, what is the significance of that? Is it that the Americans are weakened by the war in Afghanistan and therefore not going to be able to do it on their own, or, or what's the um, what's the explanation? No, no. I mean, the U.S. has always looked for like-minded countries. After all, the NATO alliance, uh, the U.S.-Europe partnership, was among one kind of liberal democracies and capitalist societies. But today, I think uh, the rise of China has created a whole range of complications. And the U.S. is saying, look, to deal with the rise of China, we need other partners beyond the traditional ones in Europe and Japan and Australia. And that's why, as India becomes the third largest economy. Uh, that there is the need to bring india uh, into a global arrangements so that there is better chances of stability and security that's the reason so it has got to do with it's not america weakening uh, it's about india becoming stronger indian economy from being a very weak economy in the 50s and 60s today is the third largest economy and uh, in, in ppp terms the so sixth largest in dollar terms but it's well on its way to become the uh, third or fourth largest economy in the next 20 years So one of the statements in the uh, joint quad state one of the sentences in the joint quad statement says the manner in which technology is designed is shared by our democratic values 
Now, do you see this as a demo, d democratic versus non-democratic world? And that's where perhaps one of the uh, fractures is. No, I, I think uh, we've seen how the particular ways in which new technologies are being deployed in China, uh, which is a, an authoritarian communist state where, where technology is being used to repress uh, the internal uh, the society within. Uh, and what, what the idea is that, look, now, when you design a new uh, artificial intelligence system or when you design new fintech uh, financial technology systems, that you need to have some values embedded within it uh, so that what comes out is much better than uh, the kind of uh, using technology merely for uh, repression uh, domestically or for contestation externally. So I think it is just the beginning. It's a philosophical approach, but it will take a long time to translate this uh, into Look, what, what kind specific of outcomes. But I don't understand. What is it? What does democratic values in technology mean? I mean, how is it going to distinguish? How, how is Look, it? I think when you, design an, design when you design an AI system, huh? Uh, what ex experience has shown that, look, uh, it tends to be racist, it tends to be misogynistic, maybe in India it will be casteist, that, that you try and avoid human biases that built in social biases, and that you can build it around genuine liberal values. I think that is the idea, uh, that it is an experiment. So uh, that, that we'll see how this, this plays out. And I think last uh, for 10 years, five years, I've seen many societies saying, like EU now says, look, when we use AI systems, there should be certain values embedded within it. Mm -hmm. When we use robot, robotic weapons, uh, that there should be some values, that it should not take out the human role outside it. So this is a, a, a whole debate within societies, between societies. So I think it's really engaging with that issue. Uh, how they actually take it forward uh, remains to be seen. Okay, there's another statement in the Quad statement which says um, that we recognize that our shared futures shall be written in the Indo-Pacific. So is it that the Indo-Pacific now becomes the, uh, the, the sort of a common meeting ground, which means is India shifting away its attention from the neighborhood, from Afghanistan towards the Indo-Pacific? I mean, Afghanistan is just an example because of the crisis unfolding there right now. No, no, I presume, you know, as Americans say, India can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, that it is not that if you do Indo-Pacific, you're not going to do South Asia, or you're not going to do the Middle East, or you're not going to do the other things. Uh, when we say that this region has become important, means the rise of China, the rise of India, and the new geopolitical contestation is concentrated today in the Indo-Pacific region. To go back to the Cold War, that was concentrated in Europe, that was concentrated in Northeast Asia. So there is a new theater that has emerged. I think that's all it's referring to, in which uh, all of us have stakes, uh, India, Japan, and Australia, part of this region. The U.S. is a resident power. So now we are saying, uh, how do we work together to produce more uh, peace and stability uh, in this part of the world? So the rise of China challenges uh, U.S. primacy. Of course, the rise of any new power uh, challenges the previous powers. And uh, the rise of U.S., for example, challenged the British primacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then the difference this time around is that when China is rising, it has become more expansionist territorially. Uh, it thinks it can take uh, territory in Ladakh. It thinks it can take territory in, uh, uh, in, uh, in South China Sea from its uh, smaller Asian neighbors, and that it can bully Australia with sanctions on trade-related issues. So I think it's not power alone is the problem. When China, if China, you know, 10 years ago, much of the world was convinced China's rise will be peaceful, and China will be this happy a partner for everyone in transforming this region. But Chinese behavior in the last few years has shown something else, that China's rise is not peaceful. China is seeking to uh, dominate the region. So that's why there is inevitably a, a, a balancing effort. Other countries are going to get together. So Australia's largest trade partner continues to be China. Why do you think Australia came on board? That's also true of India. Mm -hmm. So, in, you know, we can say good straight till recently, China was the largest partner, uh, the U.S. total trade and, and services. So that didn't stop the Chinese uh, from taking territory from you. So this idea, trade, that, you know, that you have trade does not mean you're not going to have security problems. Because people believe till now that if you have trade with China, two, two judgments were made. The Chinese thought, look, they can weaponize the trade relationship so that on political issues, they can demand compliance from Australia that they can weaponize the trade relationship. 
But on the other side, people believed that having a strong trade relationship with China, integrating China into the WTO will make it more peaceful, will make it, make it more friendly. But th that assumption has been shattered. So, so China, Australia is trying to diversify. It's ready to sell iron ore to others. Its uh, wine prices have crashed. So they've learned a lesson. So it's not that you can completely disentangle from China because it's the world's second largest economy. But uh, having bitten once, I think people are finding alternatives. India too, uh, after the Kargil war, it has sought to reduce the dependence on China. The US too, is in U US trade with China is even much bigger. Uh, so, but they're trying to now find ways of limiting some of that exposure. So, so I think Chinese behavior has woken up people into thinking, but this is not going to be a, a easy thing. Interdependence uh, does not auto automatically mean peace. You know, in India, what's happened, I think, is that since the Ladakh uh, incursions, uh, India's attempt at reducing its dependence on China has actually not worked. In fact, during the pandemic, these last 18 months, India's exposure on China or dependence has actually gone up. Look, I think, you know, you can see day-to-day -day numbers. I mean, I think uh, there was pandemic, you had to import a lot of things. Uh, give it time and uh, make, ask that question two years down the road. Let me bring you towards Afghanistan. There's a new story unfolding every day. Uh, the new government in Kabul now seeking accreditation at the UN. Do you think that the Americans which left, uh, you know, they were pretty bloodied by their experience in Afghanistan. Do you think they are going to keep a watch on what's going on in that theater, uh, or have they handed the keys over to Pakistan? The the can the Look, key. I think you know, setting an innovation or uh, react to these kind of developments. If you read the Quad statement as well as the bilateral statement, there's a the long sections on Afghanistan. Uh, there seems to be some convergence on the idea that uh, that the Security Council resolution that was passed uh, last month under India's uh, chairmanship where certain demands were made of Taliban. So the US is still saying those conditions must be met. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is China and Russia to some extent uh, who are trying to say, no, no, we must engage the Taliban. We must be nice to them. So the US is still uh, saying the same thing as India, saying that, look, there should be no terrorism. Uh, there should be respect for human rights. Uh, there should be respect for women, women's rights. But it is the Chinese. And the Russians are saying, look, don't impose your values on them. Uh, maybe we can, let's give them a chance. Let's work with Pakistan uh, that this is a, probably a different Taliban. So you don't think that the U.S. is, is likely to, uh, to stay much more engaged in the Afbak theater? Just because they pulled out military troops does not mean they're not going to be engaged. Mm -hmm. Because U.S. is still, um, they've uh, blocked uh, eight, eight or nine billion dollars of Afghan money. Uh, they still control the international uh, humanitarian lending. Uh, so they have a lot of levers to play with. So just because they don't have troops, uh, uh, Americans are not going to simply stop any all activity on Afghanistan. As I said, it is in the court joint statement as well as in the bilateral statement. Uh, the question of terrorism, question of uh, the internal behavior of the Taliban remain major issues for the U.S. The U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris said to Prime Minister Modi, this is according to India's Foreign Secretary Harsh Shingla, she brought up the question of Pakistan and says that Pakistan remains the... Uh, the, the locus of a lot of terrorist activities, terrorist groups continue to reside there. Do you think that was an interesting comment? Look, I think, you know, look, everybody knows that. Look, I mean, I think we shouldn't make, again, our media make such a big deal about it. I mean, after all, Hillary Clinton, I mean, when was it? Ten years ago, she said, no, Pakistan, if you rear snakes in your backyard, they'll come back to bite you. So I don't think it's a secret that, that Taliban sources were in Pakistan, that for, for the U.S., the question of Al-Qaeda, the question of uh, Islamic State, they're all concerns. So, so I don't think those have gone away. I think to highlight that as if this is somehow suddenly, I think, you know, Jyoti, I mean, you and I have covered the foreign office beat. Just because a statement is made, you know, that, that becomes the headline and that in fact generates a commentary. That does not mean that's the only thing. That, that India and the US know very well what is happening in Pakistan. The question is, can they act together and to restrain that? I think that is the real issue. Do you think they should act together? Look, I think it depends on the calculation of interest. At this point, we, China, sorry, US and India are saying same things. Russia and Ch China are saying something different that we got to engage the Taliban. Mm -hmm. So you can see who's saying what with us at this point. You know, the Western countries still uh, think certain conditionality should be maintained on the Taliban. China says no, they should be changed. And the Russians are somewhere slightly away from the Chinese, but they're broadly in, this, in the line of engaging the Taliban 
mode. And I think uh, that's the reality. Look, it's not that you expect others to come and be nice to you. You play the game. I mean, you wait to see how this unfolds. But the Americans have been uh, engaged with the Taliban for the longest time, much before the Chinese. Or the so you just now said, look, they've been defeated, they're gone, but they've got other levers, they're going to play. But at this point, India's convergence is still with the US and not with China and not with Russia. On Afghanistan? Yes. But my qu your question is that right now, India and the US are converging on Afghanistan and uh, but despite the fact that there, there could be other options that are open. I'm sure they're always open. Look, I think it's not a. It's look, it's not a Roman Catholic marriage. You know that uh, is this international politics. It's dynamic. Situations keep changing. Uh, these are sovereign actors. Each one makes their own calculations. So we go along with whoever we can go along at any given point of time. So don't. Nobody is going to give you a guarantee. Uh, this is my forever commitment to you or to to Taliban or to Pakistan. That so it is. It is about judging a situation. And, to, and that India is not a, a weakling, it is sitting here and it has to deal with that situation whether Americans, Russians, the Chinese, the Pakistanis and everybody in the world is with the Taliban. India will have its problems, it has to deal with it. You're so it is not, it's not a favor from anyone. We, we, at this point, you have a convergence with the Americans, see how long that goes. No, you're absolutely right, it's not a Roman Catholic marriage between India and the US or between US and the Pakistan for that matter, because as you know so closely that the Americans have worked with the Pakistanis, with the Taliban over all these past 20 years, and yet they've left and now there is there are different things happening. Sure. So the world keeps changing. Look, at the time when the Russians and the Chinese were buddies, they were commies, they were friends, the Chinese and the Russians fought. Then the Chinese and the Americans became friends. That time the Russians were upset with the Chinese, so they became our friends. Today, Russians and the Chinese are friends. All this is in the last 40 years. So, so you shouldn't be shocked when things change. So in a sense, the India's experience with the non-aligned movement, although it's been uh, quite, you know, a lot of people have been very critical about it, taught India to sort of negotiate between, you know, difficult friendships or difficult relationships, shall we say. Well, every country does it. You know, it's not something unique to us. You know, somehow in India, we believe Non-alignment is a unique Indian attribute, which is which is a kind of okay. I can understand the self-referential, self-obsession with it, but look at Pakistan. Pakistan signed security treaties with the United States in 1954, but they were also making a deal with the communist China. Well, the alliances they made with the U.S. were supposed to be against communism. They were cutting deals with the Chinese. So it's not that Pakistan is not non-aligned. Pakistan has played the realist cards. Look at. Uh, Nepal plays it so well between China and India. Sri Lanka does it so well between a neighbor and a distant power. So I think, look, everybody knows how to play this game. But it's only in India we think somehow this is a unique, special God's gift to India that it is equipped with this non-aligned brain. It's not. It's a reality. Everyone is playing balance of power politics. So Dr. Rajivan, last question. How do you look at the Quad Summit, the Prime Minister's visit to the U.S.? and the options that India has perhaps in engaging with all these other countries? No, I think uh, two, three things that have happened. I mean, I think one we've seen uh, in the last 20 years, I mean, uh, in, as India's engagement with the US expanded, uh, the trade and the security relationship and the people to people relationship has grown tremendously. Mm -hmm. So that is itself has been now become an important part of India's foreign policy. The Quad uh, is really the widening of that bilateral framework to include other partners like Japan and, uh, and Australia, and then the potential of the Quad working with the other countries on a whole range of non-military issues. And finally, uh, what we've seen with the Quad, I mean, I think uh, you recall that all these years, technology was an important part of uh, India-US yeah. engagement, but now it's been given a much wider ambit. I mean, if you read the joint statement, both of the bilateral as well as the quadrilateral, from health-related technologies to outer space, uh, from cybersecurity to 5G. So today we are talking about an expansive range of technologies, and not just between government to government, but involving the private sector, uh, involving methodologies by which we can design and develop technologies. So my sense is this is really a very ambitious, very expansive agenda that is being laid out. Uh, and I think the full results, I would say, will be visible only uh, in the in the coming years. So if it's a coalition of democracy, perhaps other democracies can join, right? I mean, the foreign minister, Mr. Jashankar, was in Europe recently in Slovenia. And perhaps other sort of, uh, in the European Union, other countries could join on, don't you think? 
So I think at this point, I mean, I think we've seen really the, the consolidation of the court with its first in-person summit. Uh, I don't think they plan to expand it like, you know, let's get new members kind of a thing. Okay. But they can always work in an ad hoc manner with other countries uh, across the board, whether it is Britain or France or, uh, or whoever it is. So the court as a collective then can develop ad hoc mechanisms to work with the other countries. And uh, it's important to note, they've also agreed to meet regularly. That means there yeah. is some institutionalization, not, you know, not institutionalization, shall we say regularization of the Quad has taken place. So I think it's finally emerging as, a, as an interesting uh, 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 platform. Uh, I, my sense is that we've just now put it down uh, firmly. So now uh, it has uh, developed it in different ways in the coming years. Right. I know that you, you know, you've said uh, earlier also that this is not a forum to contain China or to counter China. But what interests, I think, me and lots of us is that the, the Chinese are sitting on your territory in Ladakh, although there's not been a peep out of either the Indian government or the Chinese for quite a while on the Ladakh issue. Perhaps there is, um, this is deliberate and nobody wants to talk about it. But I'm just wondering how you can, you know, not counter China, although the Chinese are sitting on your territory. And Jyoti, you can't, you can't have it both ways. When you say, look, we don't want American help, we take the Chinese on our own. We don't want to be seen as taking anybody's help to deal with the Chinese threat. So don't drag us into an anti-China coalition. Next thing you say, oh, why am I, why are we not talking about defense? Why are we not talking about China? So I think we have to make up our own mind from this oscillation saying, oh, are you with us against China? Then say, oh, no, 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 you're trying to entrap me into an alliance against China. So I think it's really our debate. And the Americans are saying, look, okay, this is what you like. You don't want a military. We'll work with you in one military domain. So, but we can't have it both ways saying we, we don't want to do military stuff with you. Then say, oh, why didn't you talk military with the Americans against the Chinese? But do you want to talk military against the Chinese? No, it's, you know, look, it's a, you know, this, I'm talking about our discourse. You know, that Look, you, you know, on the one hand, you say we're autonomous. We don't want to do military coalitions. On the other hand, then you can't say, why you not talk defense with the Chinese? As I said, look, there is bilateral defense cooperation. So I think we, we tend to oscillate, you know, either we say, look, uh, why am I not there if you're not invited? For example, AUKUS. Uh, India is not going to do the kind of things Australia does with the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so I think we should be clear, look, we have a set of, set of standards, we have a set of values, we have enough capacity to take on the Chinese on the frontier, but we want to widen the relationship with the US, uh, you know, and that's what is done. But are you saying that India wanted to be part of AUKUS? Look, they don't even ask you. Look, I mean, it's not an offer. You're not going to join it if they ask you to join. Did, did India want to be? Why would it want to join? Because would you? it is not India's policy to join those kind of coalitions. Of course. You don't have to be in every coalition that emerges. So my last question is on RCEP. If you want to be parts of all these coalitions and yet you do not want to be part of a big trading arrangement like RCEP, don't you think that's a contradiction in terms? Look, RCEP, India walked out of RCEP for a reason that, that, that Chinese exports, Chinese cheap goods were swamping out India's manufacturing capacity. Therefore, you are not going to accept a situation where the Chinese wipe out what little industry there is in India. So it was a political strategic judgment. The decision has been made. But has it reduced India's total trade with the world? No. So I think, you know, we should not get into this. Look, the question is, are we trading more or less? By being in the RCEP, becoming part of a China-led economic sphere, uh, right. the political decision was that it will be too costly for India and that we must go out and build our own manufacturing capacity. And that's why you've seen this whole investment, uh, production-linked investment, trying to raise the manufacturing capacity within India. Right. Dr. Raja Mohan, thank you so much for this geopolitical lesson. It's always such a pleasure for, to talk to you and for you to explain the big picture about what's happening, not just about Prime Minister Modi's visit to the U.S. and uh, where he was uh, also a member of, uh, where he also participated at the Quad Summit. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for having me, Jit.